So last but not least, we get to selection, natural selection, and differential reproductive ability. Okay, whether or not you do well and pass on your genes to the next generation. Okay, so differential reproduction changes allele frequencies based on how many of uh, individuals in the population are breeding at any given time and what alleles those are, are giving more to in the next generation. Okay, so um, directional selection is sort of the idea of the survival of the fittest. In this case, the um, dominant allele A um, is doing really well compared to the other alleles and as, as they just produce more offspring overall. And you know something that started out as pretty even uh, has become very skewed towards the um, allele that's giving a, a very large advantage. Eventually, that dominant allele is probably going to become fixed. So why does genetic diversity even exist if it's always being pushed in one direction? Well, you know, it predicts every favorable allele should get fixed in a population. All less favorable alleles will be eliminated. Well, why isn't that true? Well, it could be that it, there just hasn't been enough time yet. It takes, you know, generations. If something is a really long generation time, it's just not there yet. Uh, you've also got genetic drift and migration. New alleles keep being added to the population, even though they're getting called out. Uh, fitness of an indiv individual depends on genes have many loci. Maybe there's a, a, you know, it's genetic hitchhiker issue where something is nearby is very useful, so you can't just get rid of the other allele. The environment is constantly changing. A favorable allele in one environment at one time may not always be the favorable allele. You might need other stuff um, to survive better. There may be other forms of selection at work. Okay, so there are many different traits in individuals in a population. So several of these are always at work at any one time. It's not ever so clear cut as like, oh, well, if they have this, they're going extinct. Blondes are going extinct. No, okay, <laughs> that's not how it works. So natural selection, major force for driving allele frequency changes. Okay, so evolution is basically the change in your gene pool over successive generations, right? So allele frequency over time. Um, and so there's the uh, bird, Darwin's finches and the beaks, right? And the thing he noticed there is whether or not you have hard, if you have very dry summers, the seeds are harder and tougher to crack. If you have very wet summers, they're smaller. So there's this interesting balance between um, beak size and fertility. And then these moths, these are the, the uh, melanized moths that um, pre-industrial rev revolution, the very light gray uh, moths blended in on the trees surrounding the um, coal mining and coal blowing smoke stacks. And then after the industrial revolution, it switched over in the, um, the darker moths actually did better because they hid better on the soot covered trees, right? So changing in response to an environment is always key. So there already, one key thing, there has to be variation already within the population for natural selection to work on. If there's not, and it's just selecting for everyone equally, you're all going extinct, right? If you don't have genetic variation in order for somebody to have something that is useful, then you're kind of flat out of luck. So how do we actually detect natural selection in populations? Well, if all genotypes do not have equal rates of survival or do not leave large numbers of offspring, then allele frequencies can change, right? If um, genotypes do have equal rates of survival, and leave equal numbers of offspring, they're not going to change. You know, if there's nothing act. If there's no pressure, then nothing's going to happen. Okay. So there's, you know, the top one here, Hardy Weinberg equilibrium, everything. There's, there's, there's no reason for these to be anything else. Nothing's acting on them. They'll just stay the same. If our allele is re lethal recessive, then sure, it'll, it'll get pushed out over and over time. It'll just be deleterious. It may not ever go away but it'll definitely get low. Um, depends on whether or not the, um, whether or not there's a push against the, if there's a pressure against the heterozygote, then it'll be sure to go after time. Yeah. So here's this, by the way, dominant alleles don't always become fixed. If there's no pressure for a dominant allele to do any better, it'll just sit there, okay? There has to be some sort of, of pressure going on like a lethal recessive. There you go. So fitness is the idea of your individual's genetic contribution to future generations. Did you survive? Did you have a lot of kids? And were your kids able to have a lot of kids? 
Okay, so the strength of selection, whether how high or low your fitness is, really determines whether or not you're being selected against. And that determines how quickly the allele is either removed from the population or fixed into the population. So here is sort of a very, very strong selection here. Just out it goes, negative selection. Very minor negative selection. It may take a very, very long time for this to get removed. And maybe in which case, environmental change and it'll be useful again, right? But too bad if you ever needed that red one again, it's gone, okay? got called out. So three requirements for natural selection. You must have that variation within a trait, okay, which originally came from a mutation. At some point your alleles were slightly different, right? It needs to be heritable, okay, so it can't be something like a um, culture or something. We'll talk about, you, you can, it gets tricky with social stuff, right, or animals that are social. And then the trait has to somehow affect reproductive success, whether or not that means you did well and could have more kids, or you could, the, the chimpanzee you mated with, you were able to bring them more food and they were able to have more, you know, of your kids mainly. Um, you need these three things in order to have um, natural selection occur. So I like how Thomas Manella puts it in his, um, uh, lecture that I linked in the YouTube playlist, the genetic heritable phenotypic differences between individuals of a single population are the driving force behind natural selection and therefore Darwinistic evolution. Okay. Natural selection results in adaptation to the local environment. Okay. Adaptation being an organism better able to survive and reproduce in its habitat. And then of course, fitness, your ability to propagate its genes. Okay. So we've got different kinds of selection here. The big main ones. Um, balancing or stabilizing selection. This right here is the frickin' optimum and deviation from the norm is not great, okay? We talked a little bit about directional selection where we are going this way because that is more useful and more advantageous right now. And then disruptive selection where, oh boy, it is not good to be here. You either gotta go low or you gotta go high. Something, something about that middle is just not great, okay? So here they are again, sort of with the mouse color. Here's our original population, had a nice variety of mouse colors. And then a uh, volcano hit, everything got sooty and black, and so all the, the darker colored mice were able to hide in the soot, and all the other ones got picked off by, by um, birds or something. Uh, in this case, uh, they all moved onto an alien planet where there's like a checkerboard, okay? And so if you were white or if you were black, you did great, but anything in between, you were really just easy pickings. And then finally, over here, um, just the land storm, land, uh, there's a giant nuclear explosion and it's radioactive land, everything's fallout. And so you want to be a nice middle gray because if you're black or white, you're going to stick out like a sore thumb. So you just need to stay right here in the middle. Okay. That's my marker. That's not helpful. So disruptive selection and stabilizing selection are kind of opposites. And we'll talk about why in a bit and how that generally happens. Okay, so here are some examples. Okay, so if we look at birth weight in pounds, there is a specific birth weight you want to be right at. You do not want to be too far or too away from that. So this is a good stabilizing selection. Um, here's some artificial selection where they've been breeding for super high protein and oil in corn and also breeding for super low amounts. So that's a good old directional selection or trying to pump something up or uh, in another uh, line or something, pump it down. Uh, I don't, there's, there's some goats here. They're really cute. Okay. And then finally, if you've got, um, this is where having a medium beak isn't super great. You either want to have a large beak that can open up tough shells or a very small beak. And so here we're seeing that disruptive uh, selection where they're, it's not great to be in the middle and we're actually going to possibly see some species going on in this disruptive uh, thing. Those finches might eventually not be able to breed anymore and become two different species. But as long as they're still in the same population, interbreeding, everything, there will be homozygous uh, dominant big beak birds and there'll be homozygous recessive little beak birds and then all the heterozygotes die all the time. But they're still interbreeding and it keeps going. Okay, so another, um, that directional selection is what people refer to as survival of the fittest, right? Selection in favor of one allele against another allele is also called 
purifying selection. Um, and that favorable, favorable allele could eventually become fixed. However, depends on the severity of difference, the size of the population, the amount of time. Uh, it, it also could reverse if the environment changes. Suddenly that thing you were going toward isn't super useful, so we're going to go back a different way, right? It's slower. This fixation is slower if, if the dominant gene is completely dominant because the um, recessive gene can kind of hide in the heterozygote. So there's no penalty to being a heterozygote. So it'll just stay there. Okay? However, if it's a lot faster if there's like incomplete dominance going on because then the heterozygotes are slightly selected again. So if the um, pure pure like homozygous dominant do the best and heterozygous do a little worse and then the uh, homozygous recessive do even more worse that'll get purified really quick because there is a disadvantage to being a homozygote next sexual selection form of natural selection again but certain features in either sex increase or decrease your mating and reproductive success that's improving your fitness. There might be a trade-off. You might have some ridiculously enormous antlers or a massive tail, but as long as it's not super inhibiting your survival, if you can still at least get to an age where you reproduce and you get to reproduce well, then it's an advantage. Okay. Group selection. If one man in a tribe invented a new snare or weapon, the tribe would increase the number, spread, supply another tribe. So tribes, so we're talking like social improvements. This is what Charles Darwin is saying. There's some evidence for this. It's proposed mechanism of evolution where natural selection is acting on a group rather than on an individual. It's contentious. People are still fighting about it. And this refers to the idea of in, you now have to have a different definition of fitness called inclusive fitness, where fitness includes offspring that you help rear in addition to your genetic offspring, right? So um, like a lot of the group you're going to be with is related to you somehow. They're your aunts, brothers, sisters, cousins. If you help your cousin raise your cousin's kids, they're kind of part you, so that can be beneficial to the group as a whole, okay? So frequency of behaviors or traits that are beneficial to the entire group, but detrimental, maybe neutral to the individuals that carry them, like uh, so we can get a whole thing on altruism. And this is other idea of kin selection, where what if it's just, you know, if you're helping your relatives, then you are actually helping your genes pass on through your relatives, even if you didn't reproduce, right? So there is, <laughs> there is a little bit of um, interestingness where they are seeing, I don't, let me highlight this down here, where uh, there's a particular allele of a, of a dopamine candidate polymorphism for altruistic behavior, where it's, um, how much money did you donate to, to a, a thing? And so carriers of at least one of this val allele donated about twice as much money as participants that didn't have that allele. Okay. So that's an interesting correlation. May not be a causation. So cooperativeness also explains. So it's about 14, remember we're talking about variance and heredity, 14.6% of the variance in donation behavior as opposed to environment things. So there could be, there could be some sort of catabolism of dopamine and how generous you feel might be part of your brain chemistry. And genetics could explain that. Kind of cool. Another type of selection, we've got meiotic drive. This is this is all three of the same thing. Meiotic drive, segregation, distortion, gametic selection. We'll sit, we'll stay with gametic selection because it's it sounds uh, a little more closely related to things. So that specifically a gamete or haploid product becomes more frequent than the others. So like somewhere in the sperm and eggs, some sperm literally do better. Some eggs literally do better than others, and there's a selection at the very gamete level. So there's this um uh, allele dependent, there's pollen tube growth and there's an allele that like really helps that. If you don't have that allele, you're probably not going to get passed on, but it is part of the, the, when the sperm hits the style. And then there's, um, this locus in mice that determines tail length and pleiotropically, uh, sperm viability. So more likely to get passed on because of that gametic selection. Differential reproduction or selection changes allele frequencies. So we have this thing called balancing selection. This is our, uh, or also called our stabilizing selection. That there is an advantage to being a heterozygote. Okay, this is generally how this is maintained. Um, both alleles are maintained in the population because it is really useful to have one copy of each. Okay, so multiple alleles are actively maintained at larger frequencies than you'd expect. Okay. This is going to conserve what we call genetic polymorphisms, or when you have different um, genes showing up at different places. So this happens due to, you know, 
through genetic drift, gene flow, recurrent mutation. And one of the key things here is that we have a heterozygote advantage. The heterozygotes have higher fitness than the homozygotes. So example, sickle cell anemia. Okay. Uh, if you have two copies of the recessive allele here, it is not great at all. You get sickle cell anemia and it's, it's the way your hemoglobin is structured is does not function normally and you get abnormal blood cells. However, uh, if you, it does prevent or at least reduce um, severity of malaria. Okay, so the allele that's responsible for sickle cell anemia is not surprisingly more prevalent in regions where malaria is common. Okay, it's a one, one um, amino acid substitution of a glutamic acid for a valine in your hemoglobin S gene, and heterozygotes are both resistant to malaria and do not have sickle cell anemia. You need to have two copies to have the anemia. So that allele is maintained in the population. Population speaking, it's it's more robust if they, even if you do have this deleterious allele, the benefit you gain from that is evolutionarily more uh, important. There's another one, the CCR5, um, heterozygote advantage there, um, that having one copy appears to have um, uh, doesn't really have a, a big infect, so there's this um, deletion that we talked about where you're resistant to HIV infection, but HIV is too recent to have been the selective agent. It's only been around since, what, like the 30s? We looked at our HIV clock early in the semester. Um, that deletion allele is really common, so there was a heterozygote advantage for this to be maintained in the population for so long. Uh, what pathogen? <laughs> so there's been, was it the bubonic plague? Was it some sort of hemorrhagic fever that we don't know was there or we haven't identified yet? Very interesting hypotheses for, um, but there, at some point there was a pathogen where having this was a definite advantage. There can also be heterozygote disadvantage, right? Where you're this is what would lead us to a disruptive selection where heterozygotes have lower fitness than either homozygotes. So there's this butterfly species, Pseudocrea uretis, that has mim uh, Batesian mimicry escape predation. But in order to have the right markings to look like the other butterfly, you have to be homozygous for a couple of traits. If you're heterozygous, you lose those key markings. So you either have to have um, homozygous dominant or recessive and then the heterozygotes get uh, removed from the population, but the two uh, the alleles are still maintained. It's just that particular genotype keeps getting removed. But since it's the heterozygote, it's not moving the allele frequency one way or another. So this is our polymorphism here where our populations have variations in phenotypes. So like in jaguars, we have light morph and we have the dark morph or the melanistic, okay? So we can have the occurrence in the same population of two or more alleles, each with appreciable frequency and they're maintained in the, in the um, uh, population. Okay, so things that do antagonistic selection. Okay, so we have opposing selective forces. So what uh, enemies are chasing gray squirrels are not the same predators that are going after black squirrels. Okay, so there's different selection going on there. Maybe even spatially different environments. Maybe um, gray squirrels are more comfortable foraging, you know, on asphalt, they're not as easy to see, whereas gray squirrels on concrete are less easy to see. So, you know, uh, they'll frequent different areas and even temporally different environments. So they active at different times of the day, but they still manage to mate and have more babies. Is there epistasis going on? Uh, different life cycle stages. Is, is, it, is it easier to be a gray squirrel when you're little? Uh, you can, you're less able to see, or is it, is it uh, more advantageous when you're older that uh, being black has more advantages? Okay, and sexual dimorphism too. So there might be, um, depending on maybe different, uh, if you're a gray squirrel, you're more into uh, female, you're more into one of the different squirrel colors, okay? So these are just, they're not gonna go, there's too many things bringing them back into the population for one of them to completely take over. And genetic hitchhiking, could just be. So balancing is maintained by this idea of frequency dependent selection that maybe fitness of whatever particular morph you are is dependent on its frequency relative to other phenotypes. Uh, and then the opposite is inverse frequency dependent selection where the rarer the phenotype, the greater the difference. We'll look at a couple um, uh, examples. And then positive, so your fitness is greater the more frequent it is in a population. Uh, so that's like prey switching. So it'll get bigger and bigger, and bigger than the. So you know we'll get um, brown rabbits and gray rabbits, and gray and gray and gray will get bigger. But then lynxes will learn. Let's go after the gray rabbits because they're so frequent. 
and the brown ones get mixed. Notice comes down like this. And now that there's more brown rabbits, lynxes have learned to go after the brown rabbits, so it comes back up. It's prey switching, right? Or the red queen hypothesis for the with a predator versus a pathogen where they keep kind of fighting each other. So you can have this fluctuating um, selection of different morphs over time. This one gets less frequent, the other will change and stuff. Okay, so this differential reproduction um, changes the allele frequencies, and here's the idea of frequency dependent selection. So, like a very infrequent allele confers resistance to a pathogen, and then we that pathogen you know comes up more and more often, and so the resistance allele increases in frequency because every individual that has more of them uh, survives better. Okay, but then maybe we have a mutant pathogen infecting our heterozygotes now, and now it can infect that instead. And so um, you're going to see the other phenotype coming back because it's suddenly more useful to that against that new pathogen, right? So we're going to see these change over time. That orange virus could mutate again and go back and infect the other one, but it'll it'll change over time. So the frequency dependent selection idea is that the favorable allele or genotype in the host depends on which allele is more common, and you'll see that a lot with host pathogen. So here's an example, Helioconus melpamine and Helioconus erato. They're um, mimicking each other in different morphs. Both are toxic. And the color morphs in different areas appear in tandem. There's strong selection against any color morphs that are different here. So they're reinforcing each other. Two different species are maintaining color morphs that match each other, um, even though they're both toxic here. Okay. And so here's the opposite, inverse frequency dependent selection. So we've got imitator salamanders only are Batesian mimics of red cheek salamanders when they are uncommon. Okay. So it's if if they're common, you don't want to be mistaken for something that everybody's looking to eat. You only want to mimic something if it's you know relatively uncommon. So sympatric sympatric distribution there when when they're actually in the same um, area with each other. Here's another one, grove snails, they're really cute. They maintain like a bajillion different kinds of color morphs in their population. Uh, and it will actually vary between these because the main predator of these are song thrushes and they'll develop what they call search image of whatever the most prevalent morph is in the area. Nail those down, the other morphs will grow in frequency, the song thrush will learn about those. So that's the, the, the prey switching basically idea. Um, and so if we want to look at selection, we can detect it directly from the genome sequence. So we can look at, okay, well, where are the synonymous sites? Where are non-synonymous substitutions between these? So there's a couple different um, genotypes there. And we can use this, what's called the jukes cantor method, where you compare two genomes and you look at the synonymous and non-synonymous substitutions. You can look at the rates there. And then you can look at the regions of the genomes, calculate how different they are, and then take a look and see whether or not um, there's been a massive amount of change. Okay, so for example, in the blue, there's no changes that are really under strong selection. In the red area, there is a big change, so something must have happened in one of those genomes to to cause that change. Um, and then in the yellow, we're seeing a strong negative selection because that has um, the uh, the rate of that area showing up has has fallen. Okay. So you can look at that and then go check out, hey, what was that gene? What are the traits there? Like what's going on and see um, what has happened in recent recent evolution. Okay, So kind of the idea for lactase permanence. We got lactose. It's a common sugar in milk. There's an enzyme called lactase that breaks it down into glucose and galactose. Okay, So lactase is the product of this LCT gene. Um, if you don't have lactase and you drink milk, you get very un comfortable um, diarrhea gas bloating as the bacteria in your large intestine go to fucking town on the lactose that passed through undigested. Okay. So at birth, um, both people with and without the LTC uh, with the gene here make uh, lactase. Okay. Most people shut off that transcription after about two years. Most other mammals do once they're weaned. People from some populations continue to transcribe that gene. Okay. So it's very common in pastoralist populations where people were um, herding goats, camels, sheep, and there was plenty of milk available, then that's, that's awesome, okay? So if you herded and you were able to drink milk, that's great because milk is, um, you know, liquid that is not contaminated with bacteria, right? Uh, fluid 
vitamins, calories, it was very advantageous to have that. So um, it's very common in populations that um, relied on that as a source of nutrients. It's very uncommon in uh, historical populations that didn't have those, um, have a milk producing animals, domesticated animals. So there's particular haplotypes that you can see that come, come along with this. Depending on um, what variations and stuff you have, you can identify exactly which um, lactase persistence haplotype was derived by looking at the sequences at each um, in the DNA. So, so different pastoralist populations have different SMPs and haplotypes, but they all confer persistent transcription of the LCT gene. So that's in the upstream regulatory region in Sierra. Um, cis regulatory module there. And so mutations for persistence occurred independently in different populations showing that here's the European Finnish one, you know, here's the here's another European but more Western European and then the Kenyan Tanzanian, Sudanese and Beijing Sudanese, but these occurred independently but selective advantage allowed them to become common in the populations. So it's that idea of kind of convergent evolution, right? Um, Another thing with haplotypes is the longer they are, um, uh, the, the more recent it's been, haplotypes recombine. There's always a chance of there being a recombination event, so they get shorter over time. So you could look at the length of the haplotype. If it's really long, it's of recent origin. And you can also see the strength of selection. So the SNPs that remain linked on a common haplotype must have had a strong selection at some point. So like this EDAR variant, Okay, which affects many processes, sweat gland production, it's a, a common factor there, uh, affects also hair thickness, sweat glands, and tooth shape, and uh, it's very, very prevalent among the ethnically Han Chinese group in China. Was there uh, a selection in the past? Maybe it was much warmer, so it was very, or uh, it was easier to cool down in a hot environment. But so you can look for these signatures, and this is how they were found, was looking for these signatures of selection within um, these human populations and comparing them to other populations. Okay, last but not least, population genetics of bacteria and other asexually reproducing organisms, which I'm going to blow through like super fast. Okay, so uh, bacteria are clonal populations. They're descended from a single ancestor and mutations show up and either go away or confer some evolutionary benefit and are retained. So this wacky looking new art down here is called a Muller plot, Herman Muller, woo, uh, shows how beneficial alleles or genotypes or phenotypes spread in a clonal population over generations. Starts out all one the same. And then we've got, you know, this happens. It sticks around for a little bit. And within that population, this green one happens. And that actually takes off pretty well. And from that, we get this interesting pink mutation. And then from within the pink, we get the red. And so there's these like variation lines. Same with the blue, you know, started off here. And then we get two interesting variations. The orange one didn't last long. It eventually disappeared down here. But this yellow one is still going straight. We still have a little bit of blue. So we can watch the um, mutations over time and plot them via these relatively interesting uh, Muller plots. The idea here is there's an idea of a fitness landscape. So some of those mutations were very beneficial. It got very great to be in that particular thing. You sort of they had to climb up a peak and it's really super awesome to be here. But if you ever wanted to go somewhere else, you'd have to lose fitness before you could get up here. And it's, it's a little hard to change the route you're on. Okay. So the, if you're at, you went, however it went, you got to fitness peak B and you really, it's, it's hard to change your strategy. You're sort of a little locked in. You would have to lose fitness in order to get over to a different route. So fitness of a population as opposed to an individual really depends on its history of genetic variation. Do you still have enough alleles left to move to a different fitness peak or have you lost those over time? Okay, so we got different combinations of genes and somehow there's a sweet spot that's just really super great. Okay. And this is where things like genetic drift and inbreeding can drive an isolated subpopulation away from a really good adaptive peak, and then it will go towards something else, right? So it's split off here, and it kind of had a low point, but it's, it's found its way here. It had enough variation to, to get up again, okay? And so there's the... Uh, so it kind of looks a little like activation energy. Once you get up somewhere, it's pretty hard to, like, go down and get up again. 
Um, and so this is where maintaining genetic variation in a population is so important because you don't want to be so specialized that you can't possibly do anything else ever again as a, as a population, right? You can't move away from your peak. That will eventually drive you to extinction if, say, the, the climate changes enough that you can't adapt to the new uh, environment. Okay, so here's a, another like kind of with bacteria, it's usually genes moving around or gene duplications. We talked about conjugation, transduction, transformation, um, and all those new genes and stuff can be selected upon. So in this long-term growth experiment, this population of E. coli that acquired the ability to utilize citrate. There was a duplication and grabbed a chunk of a different promoter. And now that it's there, this particular, the second copy, um, put this like citrate utilization gene under, under the regulation of a better promoter here. Okay, so after this, they were able to see um, this particular uh, new copy really take off in the population thanks to this duplication event. So there is selection going on in bacteria. It's just not via um, the recombination of sexual selection. It's through mutations and um, the different methods of, say, horizontal um, gene transfer. Okay, good luck. See you later.